welcome everyone. Uh, once again, we're looking into Ezekiel, uh, a prophetic book that uh, some of it has come to pass and some of it will yet be. So uh, it's, it's relevant to the day in which we live, I think. Uh, let's bow our heads before we go uh, too far, okay? Bow your heads with me. Lord God Almighty, blessed be your holy name. Lord, you are such a mighty God and a good God. We give thee thanks for forgiveness. We give thee thanks for the gifts of life. And we give thee thanks for the, your precious holy word. Now enliven the word within us that we might be better able to serve you for having studied your holy written word. We ask it in Jesus Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. All right. Um, Ezekiel chapter 8, beginning at uh, uh, verse 9. This is what... Uh, Ezekiel sees behind the wall. He said to me, go in and see the wicked, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> abominations which uh, they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls and there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Uh, each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? every man in the room of his idols, for they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. There are a lot of people say that today. Uh, they've got, they must be thinking that because they wouldn't do some of the things that they do or, or say the things they say. All right, let's look at our text. Every sort of creeping thing, the abominable beasts and all the idols. In his vision, Ezekiel saw the inside of the temple with all sorts of unclean and idolatrous things portrayed all around on the walls. The interior of the temple was supposed to have cherubim surrounding God's throne portrayed on the walls and instead had had 50 idols. God called these uh, wicked abominations the most abominable wickedness. These are loathsome in their nature and multiplied in number. Before me, Poole says. All right, there stood... Before them, 70 elders of the house of Israel. In front of these, foul and idolatrous images were the leaders of Israel, each with a censer putting forth a thick cloud of incense. They offered priestly service and incense associated with prayers in the midst of the idolatry and impurity. Elders refers to the lay leaders who had risen to prominence in Jerusalem after the deportation of Jehoiakim and his officials. These were obviously important people of the city. Uh, it mentions uh, Jeazaniah and the son, or the son of Shaphan. Shaphan is probably to be identified with Josiah's secretary of state. And Ahiakim, another of Shaphan's sons, was an influential supporter of Jeremiah. Clearly, Jeazaniah was the 
black sheep of a worthy family. The text says, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? God showed Ezekiel that the vision was about what the elders of Israel did in the dark and in the room of his idols. It wasn't about what the leaders did in the temple, but the hidden place of their heart. Uh, was filled with dark deeds and idolatry. Yet they carried on their service as if all was all right. Don't worry. I should have been an actor, shouldn't I? <laughs> I'd starve to death. All right. The Lord, uh, it says, does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. They excused their sin because they did not think Yahweh saw them, either in their minds or their actions. They also excused their sin because they believed God had forsaken Israel when in fact they had forsaken God. Just the other way around, wasn't it? Now... We're going to move to a, a kind of a sad thing here. Verse 13 and 14, let's read it together. He said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations than they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping. For Tammuz, all right, let's back up here a little bit. Uh, he says, you will see greater abominations. Ezekiel saw idolatry outside the temple and corruption among the leaders within. Yet there were greater abominations to see. Excuse me, I can't see very well myself. Uh, excuse me, all right. A text said, uh, to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. This is the only mention of Tammuz in Ezekiel and the Old Testament. This was another example of pagan worship. And Tammuz was a deity worshipped by many in neighboring nations, often with immoral and impure rights. <laughs> uh, Ezekiel was dismayed because women were there in the holy place reserved only for priests and because of their immoral idolatry. You know, there were some place they didn't belong. It's one thing, you go to heaven, there's not going to be any there that doesn't belong. I guess I could ask a question, do you belong? Verse 15, 16, priests worshiping the sun here. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? <laughs> Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Well, he said, you're going to see greater abominations than these. God continually uh, promised Ezekiel that he would see greater and greater abominations. This time his vision would display them in, in the inner court of the Lord's house. Our text also said about 25 men with their backs toward the temple and they were worshiping the sun towards the east. These men stood where the priests would normally stand to bless the people. 
yet on the temple behind them and the altar before them. It says their faces toward the east. They were worshiping the sun toward the east. They didn't worship Yahweh even at his own temple. They worshiped the sun as the other pagan nations did. Now, I tell y'all what. We have a lot of sun worshipers today. Uh, terrible. It's sad. Uh, you go to the beach. You say, well, there's nothing wrong with the beach. Yeah, if you spend more time on the beach than you do on your knees uh, speaking to God, there is something wrong with it. You say, well, you're crazy. No, I'm not. Uh, nakedness is found on the beach. Uh, the, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Well, just be careful how you utilize the gifts that God gives you. All right, verse 17 and 18, excuse me. There's a promise here. He said to me, verse 17, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. All right, it says, Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations in this vision of the temple ezekiel saw a terrible variety of idolatries and abominations the leaders and people of jerusalem regarded it all as a trivial thing uh, god didn't you know i i know i sin it's no big deal everybody's doing it <sighs> says, for they have filled the land with violence. These were not only religious or spiritual sins. Their rejection of Yahweh and his true worship led them to break down in the, uh, to a breakdown in the social order. Are we not seeing that today? It says, indeed, they put uh, the branch in their nose. This is an unusual statement used only here in the Old Testament, only here. Uh, it was some obscure expression of contempt for God. It says, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. Hmm. Because of the great idolatries and sins of Jerusalem and that the people regarded it as, you know, no big deal. It was just a, a trivial thing, the scripture says. God's judgment was assured and could not be turned back. Because, you know, Morgan says because of this utter corruption of the people, Jehovah would proceed in judgment in spite of all the loud crying of the people. You know, you'd think we'd learn after a while. Amen. All right, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 9. The people that are marked, marked for preservation, and that's a nice thing but a people marked also for judgment. There is, first of all, angelic judgment upon Jerusalem. The, 
Let's read verse 1 and 2 of Ezekiel 9. And he carried out in my hearing with a uh, called out. <laughs> and he called out in my hearing uh, with a loud voice saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, uh, each with a deadly weapon in his uh, hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a rider's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. All right, our text says, let those who have charge over the city draw near. In the vision of Jerusalem and the corruptions of the temple, Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel heard God speaking with a loud voice, calling forth six men who, in some sense, had charge over the city. All right, each man, it says, with a deadly weapon, in his hand, uh, the six men of Ezekiel's vision were armed, uh, each with a battle axe in his hand. It's best to understand these six men as angelic beings uh, with responsibility over Jerusalem. Uh, one man, it says, among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. In addition to these six men, there was another dressed differently and who also carried an inkhorn ready to write. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. The seven men, who actually seemed to be angels, were ready for service. Um, says they stood beside the bronze altar to signify that the people against whom they had their commission were for these crimes to be sanctified to the demands of divine judgment. Verse 3 and 4. Now the glory of the God of, of the God of Israel had come up from the cherubs where it had been in the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark. Watch this on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Wow. Well, get this picture now. It says, the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub. The visible representation of God's glory rose up higher than where the cherubs, where the cherubs stood. Um, said uh, had gone up the departure of the glory of the Lord from Israel is one of the basic disclosures of this uh, prophetic book so Ezekiel traces it very carefully uh, in different stages here from the cherub. For the first time in this and the following chapters, the living creatures that were the support of the Lord's throne in Ezekiel's inaugural uh, uh, vision in chapter one, uh, uh, received the name that properly applies to them, cherub, in the singular and collective and in the plural, cherubim. Uh, being of priestly descent, Ezekiel was undoubtedly f uh, familiar with the images of the cherubim in the, in the temple. Apparently, this vision offered him an opportunity 
uh, that was impossible in real life, a book into the in, a look, a look into the inner sanctum of the divine palace and holy of holies. It says, go through the midst of the city, put a mark on the foreheads. God commanded the one with the inkwell to mark the righteous men of the city. You know, there's a mark we all receive. There's the mark of damnation and then there's the mark of glory. Uh, God sees it and recognizes it because he put it there. Uh, says of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations, the remnant God would spare had nothing to do with age or uh, perceived innocent. The remnant was those who had broken hearts over the idolatry and wickedness of the city. Uh, men like Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah was called the, the weeping prophet. His heart was broken. You know, is your heart broken over sin? Not to, always a sin of others, but your own. Uh, you know, sin should break our hearts because it breaks God's heart. Uh, <sighs> All right, I want to look at this one little thing in our text that we just read, the men who sigh. Uh, sigh, S-I-G-H, will resurface in chapter 21 where the mourning will be a symptom of a broken heart and intense grief, grief over impending doom. In chapter 24, verse 17, Sigh describes the grief that Ezekiel expresses over the death of his wife. Here the scribe is to search for the individuals who will display a similar emotion over all the abominations being perpetuated in Jerusalem. Think about that. That could apply right here and now. And I, you know, we could say in Washington, don't do it. I don't care where you live. There are abominations uh, being per perpetuated uh, where you are, where you live, in the city that you're nearest. Uh, it should break our hearts. It should make us angry, too. Uh, the command to kill now in judgment. Verse uh, 5 through 7. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin in my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain, go out. And they went out and killed in the city. It says, go to him that's in the city and kill. God commanded the other of the six men to use their weapons uh, of judgment against the city as a whole, sparing none except anyone who, on whom is the mark, you know. I believe everybody's marked in one way or another. And be, I think that's scriptural. We can pr we just prove one way, and you're all familiar with the Mark 666. That's another way. Opposite uh, uh, destinies, isn't it? And begin and at my sanctuary. God decrees that judgment should begin at his house. 
Uh, Peter later applied this principle to the people of God under the new covenant in 1 Peter 4.17. Therefore, these judgment, judging angels began with the elders who were before the temple. Judgment begins with, you know, with the, with the ministers, uh, the elders, the priests, the, the bishops, the archbishops, the pope. That's where judgment starts. It starts at the top and works down. Um, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. God promised that he would defile and de desecrate the pagan altars on the high places because of Israel's idolatry. Here he promised well, let me back up a little bit. I don't want to get up too far. Uh, God promised that he would defile and desecrate the pagan altars and the high because of Israel's idolatry. Here, he promised the same desecration at his own house. These people had defied or defiled God's house by their wicked lives, and now they would defile it further in their terrible deaths. That's that's a statement made by uh, uh, Wearsby, if you're familiar with him. Wearsby uh, wrote some excellent commentaries. Uh, now, Ezekiel's... Uh, reaction to all this in verse 8 it says so it was that while they were killing them i was left alone and i fell on my face and cried out and said ah lord god will you destroy all the remnant of israel and pouring out your fury on jerusalem i fell on my face and cried it says uh, though ezekiel had many times announced such a severe judgment when he actually saw it carried out in his vision it made him completely beside himself undone will you destroy all the remnant of israel the text says in desperation our lord god ezekiel begged god to not destroy the remnant as he poured out his fury on Jerusalem. I think that's a good uh, place uh, for us to stop. We're going to pick up at verse 9 of chapter 9 next week. Uh, I, I am so glad you're with me on this journey through Ezekiel. Uh, it, it's uh, revelating is the best way I can describe it. I just made up a word. Uh, but anyway, let's go to our God in prayer. For, Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for what we see and what we hear and what we feel through your word. Bless us now as we go into the world, being aware of a world in which we live that is unacceptable in thy sight. Help us, dear Lord, to bring others to you before it's too late. In the name of Jesus Christ, go in peace. Amen. And amen, brethren. I'll see you next week.